importante per la scuola perché abbiamo un ospite di eccezione, un grande della medicina populistica e quindi che parliamo del biologo dottor Michael Dendro. nel campo della rivista medicina oculistica e soprattutto insomma, è membro anziano del, del CIG, quindi il centro uh, intelligence design. Va bene, quindi io ringrazio lui, ringrazio il presidente del CIG che sarebbe Carlo Roberto Cassano. Prego. che c'è un'ora della sua presenza oggi e che è autore, come è stato brillantemente detto, di studi fondamentali. Non uso parole a caso, faccio un giornalista tra l'altro, quindi sarebbe fuori luogo usarle a caso. A caso. Fondamentali vuol dire che fondano. Lo studio di, ehm, del professor Denton del 1985, se la, mem se la memoria non mi inganna, eh, Evolution and Theory in Crisis, di cui ho una copia, poi ve la mostro se volete, mi sono dimenticato di tirarla fuori dello zainetto, ma è lì, è fondativa perché pone una questione importante e fa quello che non si fa più oggigiorno. Se in questo momento io dicessi che dà delle risposte a domande, direi una banalità, non fa questo. Pone delle domande come logica vorrebbe, prima di dare le risposte. Viviamo in un tempo in cui invece le risposte spesso arrivano prima delle domande e quindi sono risposte preconcette e quindi sono pre, eh, risposte pregiudiziali e quindi tristemente sono poi anche risposte ideologiche. In alcun campo questo deve essere praticato, men che meno nell'ambito scientifico, nell'ambito della scienza che opera per via empirica, attraverso dati di fatto, attraverso constatazioni, attraverso inferenze, ma sempre ancorato fondamentalmente alla realtà. E quindi un atteggiamento in cui le risposte arrivano prima delle domande, in ambito scientifico, non, proprio non si dà, non si deve sentire. Michael Denton è la persona che ha iniziato, insieme ad altri evidentemente, ma ha posto una pietra miliare in questo riordine logico minimale, minimalistico se volete, del pensiero umano le domande prima delle risposte e se le risposte non si hanno, se le risposte non vengono o se le risposte ancora non sono venute, si attende fino a quando le risposte non sono disponibili. Questo è il procedimento della scienza o dovrebbe essere il procedimento della scienza. Michael Denton, che ci onora della sua presenza oggi, è con alcuni suoi colleghi una delle persone che ha iniziato, ha riniziato questo procedimento e da mille lontano, ormai 1985, credo che nessuno di voi in sala, sto parlando degli studenti, fosse nato a quell'epoca, di strada ne è, stata, eh, ne è stata fatta. Lo studio dell'85 di Michael Denton inizia quel procedimento di riappropriazione della scienza secondo i suoi termini che corre sotto il nome di progetto intelligente e che ci appassiona da questa parte del tavolo e sono sicuro anche da quella parte del tavolo. Nasce negli Stati Uniti il Discovery Institute a Seattle che diventa prestissimo ehm, il faro illuminante di questi studi che ci onora del Discovery Institute, della propria amicizia, della propria collaborazione. In Italia molto più recentemente nasce il centro italiano ehm, per l'intelligent design che ospita 
questo tentativo di rifare scienza secondo canoni scientifici e che quindi oggi eh, vi propone Michael Denton con eh, i suoi studi, con le sue ricerche e con le sue constatazioni di dati di fatto e se mi permettete ancora una volta con le domande prima ancora che eh, le risposte. A partire dagli studi iniziali di Michael Denton, il, il, quel fenomeno che si chiama eh, progetto intelligente inizia, si sviluppa e ottiene grandi successi, se mi permettete e chiudo, non sul piano ideologico, non sul piano propagandistico, non sul piano giornalistico, ma sul piano scientifico, come deve muoversi ogni e qualunque eh, riflessione su quel tema, se mi permettete, affascinante e meraviglioso, rappresenta la poesia dell'esistenza e dello sviluppo della vita sulla Terra. Il professor Michael Denton, biochimico australiano, è qui per raccontarcelo oggi. Welcome so much, uh, welcome our professor Denton, it's a pleasure to have you here, I know you're enjoying Italy and we will enjoy your talk. The professor Michael Denton. beings of our physiological design. And I see the accumulating scientific evidence as increasingly <coughs> supportive of the idea that we have some special place in nature. And the, the talk has to begin, I think, with just um, reiterating the many evil view. So, just briefly, this is um, uh, just a, a quote from a, a book about many evil, the many evil world view. And just quoting from the book, the philosophers of the 12th century speak of the necessity of studying nature, for in the cognition of nature in all her depths, man finds himself. Underlying these arguments and images is a confident belief in the unity and beauty of the world, and also the conviction of the central place in the world which God has created belongs to man. And their, their anthropocentric conception was really quite extraordinary. Each part of the human body corresponded to a part of the universe, the head to the sky, the breath to the air, the stomach to the sea, the feet to the earth, the bones corresponded to the rocks, the veins, and the branches of the trees. So all our ancestors, or certainly all our intellectual ancestors, considered man had some significant place in the order of things. And also, in fact, they saw the earth and man's existence as playing, of course, a role in the great drama of redemption. Well, we all know what happened. Um, uh, and the, at the beginning of the scientific revolution, the work of Copernicus and the work of um, the great anatomists in Padua, not far from here, um, there was no evident connection in the early days of science between man and the universe. Indeed, if you look at this, if you look at the Copernican circles um, of the orbits of the planets, and you look at um, the, the human body, the fabrica, there's no connection. And this went on for the next several centuries of science, until the beginning, perhaps, of organic chemistry in the 19th century, and then through various developments in the 20th century. But for the first few Uh, centuries of the scientific revolution, there was no evidence to believe that man had any special place in nature. But over the last um, century and a half, it's become increasingly evident that there's something very special about carbon-based life. Um, and I, I look upon the acknowledgement that the universe is uniquely fit for carbon-based life is the first step towards the anthropocentric worldview, the first step back towards an anthropocentric worldview, the discovery of the unique fitness of nature for carbon-based life. And very, and very briefly, 
It turns out, in fact, there's only four atoms in the periodic table. Non-metals, non-metal atoms, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, which make strong, stable, directional chemical bonds, generating stable molecules with shape. All biochemical functions depend on the complex shape of molecules, and without these strong, stable, covalent, directional bonds that are being made by carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, you, you couldn't have um, complex biochemical functions. So today, uh, it's no longer really controversial that uh, the, um, the carbon chemistry provides the best debate, the only probably the only basis for complex chemical life. When NASA look for life in space, uh, they look for they follow the water and they look for organic compounds. Um, in the 16th of September, there was a NASA breakthrough as the rover found strong signals of organic matter on Mars. And even Carl Sagan conceded he was a carbon chauvinist. So it's no longer controversial that in fact the universe appears to be uniquely fit for carbon-based life or arranged for carbon-based life, if you want to put it like that. Okay, so basically the first step in a sense has been taken back towards that conception that there was something uniquely fit in nature for, our, for, the, for the, the carbon based chemistry of our body, the universe looks uniquely fit for that. Okay. But what are the higher carbon based life forms like um, modern humans? Well, I believe there's accumulating evidence, um, it's not just uh, carbon based life uh, which appears to be uniquely fit and for which the laws of nature seem to have been uniquely arranged. Um, forms like ourselves, sharing our physiological design, um, seem also to be unique, seem to have a unique place in nature. And what I'm going to do now in the talk is look at the fitness of nature for terrestrial air breathing beings of our physiological design. And I'm going to look at three phenomena. I'm going to look, look at the hydrological cycle, which makes possible land based terrestrial life, not forms like myself. I'm going to look at the photosynthesis, and look at nature's fitness for the generation of oxygen, which is essential for advanced carbon-based life. Um, and I'm also going to look at the atmosphere, the fitness of oxygen and nitrogen. First of all, let's consider the hydrological cycle um, and nature's fitness for terrestrial life. This is a very familiar cycle. We all know about it to a degree. We see, we see water evaporating and we see rain falling, and we see rivers taking the rain that falls back to the sea. But few of us know that the cycle depends on the unique capacity of water to exist in three material states in ambient conditions on Earth. Water exists as a vapor, it exists as a liquid, and it exists as a solid. Within the ambient temperature range on Earth, those, it's the only substance known which exist in those three forms. And it's those three forms which make possible the water cycle. So it's worth stressing that this, this cycle is critical to our existence. We are terrestrial beings living, living on the land. And without this cycle, we certainly would not be here. Um, and just to look at some of the... The, the, the basic cycle itself um, is only possible because of that unique property of water that it it exists in three material states in ambient conditions on, on the surface of this planet. But water has many other, this is really very remarkable now. So water has one fundamental uh, unique fitness for the hydrological cycle. But as the cycle turns, water has other elements of fitness, which are essential for the um, for not only bringing water to the land, but also bringing minerals from the rocks and eroding the rocks into soil. Uh, and one example of this is water's mobility as a liquid and a solid, which is perfectly fit for erosion of the rocks. <coughs> so water's mobility aids greatly in the way it um, erodes the rocks. It tumbles over mountains, through mountain gorges and over waterfalls and things. But water's power as a solvent is also fit for leaching the essential minerals from the rocks. Um, water's erosion and the weathering of the rocks provide the essential minerals for life on the land. You do, the hydrological cycle provides the water on the land, and now we see that it's eroding the rocks, and it's providing minerals for life on the land as well. 
So that just lists, let's look at some of the actual ways in which water is uniquely fit for the eroding and weathering of the rocks. First of all, water has a very high surface tension. And this draws water into the rocks, into the cracks in the rocks. And um, basically, then in the higher latitudes and in the mountains, that water expands and it breaks down the rocks. So surface tension plus the expansion on freezing assists the erosion of the rocks. And of course, as I said on the last slide, being an excellent solvent aids the leaching of the essential minerals from the rocks and their distribution throughout the terrestrial of hydrosphere. Another, another feature of nature which um, um, enhances the weathering of the rocks is the formation of carbonic acid, which further aids the chemical weathering of the rocks. And as I already stressed about the mobility of water, the low viscosity of water creates rapid running streams and rivers which promote erosion. And the low viscosity of ice also, compared as, 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 a, as a crystalline solid, the viscosity of ice is probably lower than almost all other crystalline solids, and this of course aids erosion of mountains by glacial action. But life on the land needs more than more than um, water. It needs more than the minerals. It also needs water retaining soils because it doesn't rain all the time. For plants, for plants, it's essential that you have water retaining soils. And guess what? The same erosional processes which are drawing the minerals from the rocks, ultimately generate the soils, which have just the properties for the growth of the plants. Um, so basically, this remarkable cycle, the hydrological cycle, which is vital for life on the land, involves an extraordinary geological hierarchy of unique properties of water. Several unique properties of water are critical uh, to the, the turning of the wheel, and the erosion of the rocks and making a habitat, a terrestrial habitat, uh, which can su sustain organisms like us. Um, I find it really remarkable that in fact, various um, unique features of properties of water, like for instance its sol power of the solvent, its uh, surface tensions, its expansion on freezing, depend on a prior, a prior uh, <laughs> property of water fact that it exists in three material forms. <laughs> so you've got several properties of water which operate like in a hierarchy to generate life on the land. Um, I find the, the inference of design in that really quite, very, very powerful. It's extraordinary. Properties of water should operate on so many different levels to generate a, a terrestrial habitat capable for us.